Shabbat Shalom. I hope you are doing well wherever you may be. <clears throat> I have really uh, struggled with this Torah portion, and um, but as I've wrestled through it, I think I've stumbled upon something that I think is significant. Obviously, there's nothing new under the sun, but I believe it may help us just to understand how uh, how the temple and sacred space is connected to how God chose to reveal himself to ancient Israel. And, and so we know the general story that Israel was hearing the words from our father, just powerful and majestic words and just, uh, just instilled fear in them. And then it proceeded to them saying to Moses, listen, you go and, and go and get the, uh, uh, any further words and so Moses went up and so we have this Torah portion of Mishpatim and what certainly stands out to me in this portion is the last couple of chapters where we have uh, where we have the just the essence of how God was going to commune with Israel because we have this tension between him being so transcendent and powerful and us being sinful but anyway, Moses went down and then we see it's an interesting description that he is called up again. Uh, and the description was, come up to Yehovah. And, 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 and we see that Moses at the base of the mountain, he, he, he makes an altar. And him and 70 of the elders, Nadab, Abihu, uh, I think Aaron, uh, they go up to uh, the next kind of space. And there they commune with God, they eat and drink and have a meal. And the interesting description there is that it says that they looked upon, <clears throat> they saw the God of Israel. And this is, this is really a big statement. Um, and what's also interesting is that uh, it seems to be in that almost most holy area that they weren't allowed to go up to except for Moses. So kind of like Aaron with the tabernacle was the high priest could only go to that upper place. So we see with Moses this uh, interesting, uh, the, this interesting uh, movement of, of approaching God and also the description of they saw the God of Israel. Now, the first thing that uh, was quite, quite a revelation or, or something to see, it came from a man called, I think it's Angel Manuel uh, Rodriguez, did a, um, compared Sinai with sanctuary, uh, the idea of a sanctuary. And what you actually see is Sinai becomes a sacred space, very similar to the tabernacle. I don't know if you've seen that before, where it's kind of the general common area. We remember they demarcated it, do not go beyond this. And then you have that kind of inner area where there's this uh, 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 communion going on or, or they would feast with God, very similar to the tabernacle. We're also in, in the holy place. Uh, they would eat the bread, the priests would eat the bread of the presence. And then finally, this last level of, of the, the holy of holies. And what's interesting is to also to learn a little bit about what the structure meant and and to really understand what did it mean that at this uh, at this level at the most holy part that they saw the God of Israel I want to read uh, from uh, this uh, article and it describes how the near in the Near East they used to understand temples and sacred space it says, throughout the ancient Near East in general, sanctuaries, temples were built for the gods and were considered to be the earthly dwellings of the gods. The image of the god was placed in the temple, and let's be honest, it was placed in the most holy part of the temple, uh, as a symbol of the presence of the deity. As a matter of fact, the god was considered to be somehow present in his image. So we often actually don't realize this, but in ancient cultures, or we think when we think of Hinduism and, and other kind of uh, idolatrous forms of worship, when we think of their temple, we think of the idol as their god. Um, to properly understand it is that actually they believed it was the image of their god. 
And this becomes quite interesting because uh, we see the same kind of use of sacred space being, being used with a God. And in the most holy part, we see that he reveals his image. Now for Israel, the understanding was that they have a living image. The one thing we need to realize is that uh, we were never meant to think of the greater reality, Father God, as being localized. We can see this with Solomon in, in 1 Kings, where he refers, he's just built the temple, the sacred space, and then he says, you know, does God live in temples? Uh, he says, even the heaven of heavens cannot contain him. He speaks of that greater reality, Father God, um, in, in that understanding. But that doesn't mean that the temple had no place. Paul would also be, it would seem to be dismissive, but he's just giving glory to the greater reality of how these, uh, how we were to understand these spaces, that the greater God was not contained in the spaces, but that it was his image. Paul would say, God does not dwell in the temples made of man. Now we know there's a duality here, don't we? Because we know that God did dwell in the, in the temple and there was a special presence. We should also understand that there was something understood between an image that could represent what was greater than and to be slow to just attribute to the personifications, the person that dwelt in Israel's midst as yod heh as Yehovah, as Jehovah God, as being the Father. Um, we must really be slow to that, especially this direct revelation. We see, so when we read things about, I'm thinking Psalm 80, where it says, Hear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who dwell between the cherubim, shine forth. Uh, this localized idea of in the tabernacle, there was one who dwelt there. From the ancient temple structure and tabernacles and sacred spaces, that's referring to the one who is the image of God. Same with Joshua, they messed up in, a, in battle with AI and then they want to find out what they did wrong and you read there of how they went before the Lord uh, you know, in the tabernacle as though their God was there and that makes so much sense but not to attribute a localized revelation, one that could be housed in a temple with Father God. No, this was the image of that God and we begin to understand that this Messiah and to really uh, understand Paul's words in Colossians chapter 1 when he said and hear them in a in a temple understand when he refers to Messiah as no he is the image of the invisible God same with Samuel when it says that they they went to Yehovah of hosts who lived in Shiloh again that localized idea it was most glorious in Israel. We know his presence was there, but that this one was the image of God that dwelt in the temple. In fact, we get this in John chapter 12 as well, where, where, where they understood this is the Son of God. This was the Son of God in Scripture that uh, tabernacled amongst him this unique revelation. And where they referred to their... Uh, the understanding that when Isaiah said, I've seen my God in the temple, I've seen him with my eyes, that this was talking of the image of the invisible God, uh, that Isaiah saw him, Yeshua, in glory. And so God has revealed his, uh, I believe, if we look at the structure of uh, Sinai, that holy place, that is where you reveal your image. And so he revealed the image to Moses. But what we get is another glorious idea that begins to come through is as God begins to say that actually, uh, I, I want my son, I want my image to dwell amongst you. And if we replicate the pattern of the, of the mountain, uh, if we do this tabernacle structure, that he is humble enough, he will dwell in your midst and you can have him live in your presence. And so this is the wonderful mystery that we see in, in the book of Exodus, as God would say, in, uh, particularly in Exodus chapter 25, it's the most beautiful part, that he may dwell, that, that build a sanctuary that I may dwell within you. And we understand this through 
the Son of God. And, uh, and he says, and, and this concerning the special revelation, you can come to me, the one enthroned between the cherubim. Come, to, come there and inquire of me. Um, and as we see from uh, the, the understanding of Near Eastern uh, sanctuaries, that this is referring to his unique image that would be uh, in Israel. And, and so this also helps us, I think, with another passage that I've wrestled with for a long time, and that is in Exodus chapter 33. And here it speaks of, it speaks of the glory cloud, and we've seen this, this is Messiah, uh, the unique Malach, the sent one of God. He is sometimes not in glory. Um, or, or to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, certainly he was out of glory. But in that generation, this, he was just in glory, and all they could see was this cloud of his presence. And in Exodus chapter 33, what we see is Moses is approaching the tabernacle. The tabernacle is built at this time, and we see that this one descends and comes and talks with Moses. And as they meet, uh, Israel is there standing, and as they see as they see this one, it says that they worship him. And, and so they have this conversation. And I've often wondered what it was about. And I think it, was, it went something like this, because it, 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 it makes a lot of sense. I believe Moses, he got to hear the voice of the Son of God and would chat to the image of Israel's God, that unique presence in their midst. And he just wanted to see him like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob knew. Um, and he had not yet seen his form. And I think this is what they were chatting of, especially in the light of the verses that follow. Because what we see is that it then it's a unique phrasing where it says, and then he turned and he went, he left the tabernacle, he went into the camp, so away from the tabernacle, and, and Joshua stayed there with uh, the glorious uh, messenger of God there. Uh, why this is important is then he cries out to Yehovah, he cries out to, we would understand, the broader concept or the greater revelation of God, as we understand, Father God, and, and we can read about that conversation. And Moses said to Yehovah, see, you're saying to me, bring up this people, and you have not caused me to know whom you send with me. And you've said, I know you by name, and you have also uh, found grace in my eyes. And now if please, uh, I've found grace in your eyes, please cause me to know your way. And I know you, so that I find grace in your eyes, and consider that this nation is your people. And he said, my presence goes, and I have given rest to you. And he said to him, and he said to him if your presence is not going, do not take us from this place. And in what is, and, and in what is it known now that I found grace in your eyes, I and your people, is it not in your going with us? And we have been distinguished, I and your people, from all the people who are on the face of the ground. A quite literal uh, translation, this one. Um, and... And anyway, what we have is this interesting situation where he says, I want to know this one. And then God goes on to say, uh, even this thing which you have spoken, I will do. And what we see is in the next chapter, he sees the, the, uh, the form, let's say, of this God. Before they saw him in glory, the 70 elders, they all looked at him. He was there in the Holy of Holies as the mountain was. Um, and, and, and yet they had not, he was in glory, so they couldn't see the form. It's till this point that God blesses Moses to see him in a way that he could discern at least his figure, but he could not look on his face because we know the Messiah was still in glory here. This localized presence that can come from the Father. And so we read all this, uh, all this uh, description here. And what's really interesting is it becomes very much one, as though this one is God's image. The one he's sending, he says, you will not see my back. Uh, oh, sorry, you'll see my back, but you cannot see my face. And he speaks one as though this one is literally his likeness and image. In this part of Israel being at Mount Sinai, there's this wrestle and this tussle between 
the unique revelation of the cloud and God in general, who, uh, who we know could never be contained. We can't even look upon him. He's too holy. Uh, we can just about hear his voice. But there is also his image that was manifest and who he elevates. And that's also what we see at the end of Mishpatim, where he begins to, he says, I send my messenger to be with you. He describes uh, how he's, uh, you know, listen to him. Uh, do all that I speak when he speaks. Um, he will not pardon your transgressions. We just see that he is one with the Father. Now, this is how we see it. Now, the problem is, is, is that, well, um, many struggle with this, many within Judaism, what to do with this guide, with this cloud person. I've got here a quote from, uh, from the Talmud. And so here we read, anyway, it says, Rav Nachman said, uh, a person who knows how to answer the minim, that's the heretic, as Rav Idi, let him answer, and if not, let him not answer. A certain men, sectarian or heretic, said to Ravidi, It is written, and to Moses he said, Come up unto Yehovah. Uh, that's that uh, quote uh, from Exodus chapter 24. Um, it should have said, Come up to me. Mm, so they're noticing, you know, the wording is a little bit like, uh, you know, this is maybe localized Yehovah, or it, it just reads a little different. Now, Rav, uh, uh, Rav Idi, he knows where this is going, because this is what precedes. Come up to Yehovah, and then they saw the God of Israel. So he goes straight into this, and he describes the one they saw as, He, Rav Idi, said to them, this was Metatron, whose name is like the name of his master, as it is written, my name is in him. This is from the previous chapter when it's talking about, uh, I send my messenger with you, my name is in him. So this theophany, well, the seeing of God, they're saying, is this Malach, is this messenger, uh, the Jews of that day would call him Metatron. And so the, you know, the heretic, like many of us would say, well, you know, if so, they should worship him. I mean, this one, uh, he goes on to, <clears throat> uh, and then there's this rebuttal. It is written, do not rebel against him. And then the rabbi uh, interprets this as, do not confuse him with me. Do not begin to make a chat. Do not begin to see this as a complexity within the God of Israel. If I can add my interpretation of what he's saying there. But here, here the, the heretic goes on to say, why does it say he will not forgive your sins? You know, and this is a big part because sins committed against God or the one you're in covenant with, it seems that this one is a covenant maker, the one that they looked upon. And then they said, and these are really jarring words, we have sworn that we would not even receive him as a guide. For it is written, if your face does not go up, uh, do not bring us up from here and then it jumps to that part in Exodus chapter 33 where we get that oneness and where well we you know we interpret this differently that no he was saying I want to know the guide the one you will send with me and when he says you know don't let you know your presence we want your face your presence to go with us it was not to the exclusion of this one but it was that, that you would remain with, with us. And Moses was trying to understand how God can be there in, in Israel's midst. And so it's really interesting to see how, uh, how temple theology might be able to help us understand where the Son of God is. That when we get these isolated or localized ideas of God was right there or God was in their midst as a person, and uh, to rather view this as this is the image of the invisible God, as Paul would say, how amazing that we may know this God, that he may reveal his image, that he could dwell in our midst, as Revelation says, that one day, that one day there's no need for a temple, for the sin will have been dealt with, and, and us who we should really be at the bottom, you know, with the altars and that, will be able to approach and come near him and, uh, and be in his midst. And what a beautiful day that will be. Pray you have a blessed Sabbath. Shalom.